This is Modern Persian Food, a culinary podcast for today's food enthusiasts. We talk about classic Persian flavors, modern recipes, and embracing culture and identity through food. I'm Bita. And I'm also Bita. Welcome to our show. Hi, friends. Welcome to episode 151. Today, we're very happy to be joined by Sagar Setare, known as Lab Noon on the internet and Noon on her newsletter. She's a writer, a recipe developer, a cooking class and photography teacher, and occasionally a food tour guide in Rome. Today, we'll be digging into her new cookbook, Pomegranates and Artichokes, A Food Journey from Iran to Italy. And we are sitting here seeing each other's faces from multiple locations. Welcome to Modern Persian Food, Saga Jan. Hi, Mira. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for this beautiful introduction and pronouncing my name correctly. It makes oh. such a nice difference once in a while. <laughs> Great. And we're also here with the other Vita Jin, lovely co-host. Hi, Vita Jin. Hi there, ladies. Happy to have this conversation today. We're wrapping up our little series that we've had this summer on up and coming Persian authors, Persian cookbook authors. And we are excited to dig into pomegranates and artichokes with you, Sakajun. Thank you. I'm very excited. Also very, very excited to be, you know, among other Iranian cookbook authors. Yeah, we've had like a really great lineup. We're having a moment this year, aren't we? Yeah. And what I love about it is the books are all very different. You would think that like, you know, it's Persian food. So how many different variations can you do? But we've actually seen a big spectrum of different types of content and different themes. So let's dive into your book. Do you want to maybe start off with telling us a little bit of kind of the inspiration that led you to writing the book? My book is not just about Iranian food. It's a little bit autobiographical, and I started to notice food in general, and I started first to notice Italian food already after having lived here in Italy for something like about three or four years, which happens to a lot of other foreigners, let's say people coming from the States or the UK a lot earlier because they get to, you know, experience that sort of more Dolce Vita under the Tuscan sun, eat, pray, love experience. Whereas for me, coming here as a student from Iran, I didn't really have that sort of experience. I couldn't afford it. It was not on my radar. And I would say for a lot of Iranian students, at least back in those days, I wouldn't know now, but you know, in general, I believe those experience can be quite different. And when I started to notice Italian food, this is the moment I actually became very interested about Iranian food. And I started to notice some similarities between them. And they are much, much, much more than you could absolutely imagine. Some of these similarities have historical basis. Some of them are just, you know, same ideas popping up in very different places that may have similar climatic situations. And I wanted to use food as a context to talk about people because it's always the people who make the food, who grow the food, who come up with the recipes. And I wanted to use this concept of borderless recipes and the food that can get influenced by the travels of human being as a context to talk about, you know, migration in our days, especially migration, I would say, in Italy and this part of Europe, because it's my experience and it's also the, the place that gets a lot of migrants from over the seas. So it's mostly a, a cookbook about movement, I would say. It has three chapters. There's a little map in the book. It starts in Iran. Then it literally travels west in this chapter that I've called In Between. And we have all the Levant area and Turkey and Greece. And then it arrives to Italy, which is the third chapter. I like how you segmented it. It's very unique in the way that you did that. I also grabbed a little piece out, which is just what you were talking about. Migration of ingredients, of recipes, and of stories, a fluid concept of home without borders. And your reference to eggplant was one that I really liked. Yes. 
Yes, that's that's a very interesting story because there is this concept of authenticity and we think that, oh, you know, these recipes were, you know, written in stone and they have always existed. And then when you dig into them, you see that, no, it's not like that. Some of them are actually very, very young, especially in a country like Italy, that it is very, very old. You, you know, I walk out of my home, I see things that are 2000 years old and then recipes that are not even 150 years old. So, you know, in context, it's you know very new thing. It's interesting. I think we did a recent listener survey and our listeners are actually very interested in the history of ingredients and food. And you do touch on that in the way that you describe things in your book. Yes, some of them, especially the story with the eggplant is one of those things that I find very fascinating because the eggplant apparently it arrives from China and India and then it existed in ancient Persia in some recipes, but we have no written recipes left from those times. We don't have any manuscripts. And then it travels when, when the Arabs conquer the, the whole era we have a lot of very, very good manuscripts from the medieval times of the Abbasid Empire, actually. And it's very interesting because first, in around like the 8th and 9th century, they are not very keen about the eggplant. And, you know, this is medieval physicians all over, both in Europe and in the Persia Arab world. They were very suspicious <laughs> of raw fruit and vegetable or fruit and vegetable in general but especially raw ones they would say oh they're very bad for you you shouldn't eat them especially eggplant you know it got a very very bad rap because they thought it was poisonous because it looked like another plant that was poisonous and it had this bitter water that they said it was poisonous and you can tell from these little anecdotes that are written in these manuscripts that first they say, oh, no, 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 I would not eat this. And then a few years or a century passes by, they say, oh, you know, even the doctor, that the doctor says I should not eat it. It's very delicious and I do eat it. And then in uh, 11th century, the Arabs conquer the south of Europe. So south of Italy and Spain. And the same thing happens in Italy. The Christians, the Catholics of Italy would not eat this new vegetables that was brought by these Arab, by the Saracens conquerors. So they would not eat it. Now, just imagine for a second an Italy without eggplant. <laughs> right. <laughs> No Parmesan. <laughs> exactly. No, no eggplant Parmesan. So the thing that happens and is very interesting is that when in this very Catholic society, the majority of, of people refuses to eat this ingredient, it's left to the outcast, which in this case was the Jews. And it's the Jews who adopt the eggplant and, you know, fry it and make a lot of delicious dishes. A lot of the, I would say, Perhaps most of the dishes that we now know as Italian dishes with eggplants are all Jewish dishes, like parmigiana, la caponata, all of those things. But, you know, just to think about that, you know, there was this total refusal of something that was coming and then it was embraced and now you wouldn't even recognize it. That's a great story because, it, it, yeah, it just tells so much. Yeah, the evolution. Exactly. And, and we're not even talking about tomato because, you know, with the eggplant, this happened like in 11th and 12th century. With the tomato, it happened in the 16th century. And it wasn't until uh, late 19th century that tomato became mainstream in Italy. So this was after the unification. Wow. Wow. That's super interesting, I think. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That was a cool of perspective and little history lesson for us. Thank you. Now, is your background, your your roots, Azerbaijani, Tabriz? Yeah, so my, both my grandparents, they would say that they were from Azerbaijan, although none of them never, ever lived there. Oh. So my maternal side, they lived in Mashhad, and they were born around Mashhad. And my paternal side, they were in Tehran, and I don't know where else, but they would always say that we are, we are from Tabriz. And actually, mm -hmm. I'm very sad because I never had the opportunity to ask them how and why, because while they were, 
they were alive and well. I did not think about this somehow. Mm-hmm. But this is a mystery to me. That I mean, if you were from Azerbaijan, how did you end up in Mashhad in Khorasan, which is literally on the other side of the country? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you can see it through their food. So the food that my, I mean, they spoke, of course, they spoke Azari at home. And you could see it in their food. So I found some recipes that were, you know, legit Azaris. But my mom, for example, would always say, for example, let's say dolme bag or, you know, the, the vine leaves, the stuffed wine leaves. She would always say, we make it like this. The Persians, they make it like this. So she would make the distinction. Even she never, she did, doesn't even speak Azari. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Hey, friends, just wanted to ask you a quick favor. If you would like to join on to our mailing list, there's three ways that you can do that. You can either go to our website, modernpersianfood.com. You can scroll down in the show notes in whatever app you're using to listen to this podcast. And there is a button that you can click to sign up for the newsletter. Or on Instagram, we have it in our bio, direct links that you can sign up. Sign up and don't skip a beat. You bring up dolme, which is really interesting because... You know, dolme was one of those foods that when I was looking through like a Sicilian cookbook, my sister-in-law is Sicilian actually, and they gifted me a beautiful cookbook from Sicily. And I was flipping through it and I was like, oh, dolme, oh, stuffed different things. Oh, saffron, these eggplant dishes. And it was really interesting how these dishes weren't just specific to Iran and Persia, but they were part of the broader area as well. And I think that your book does a really great job of kind of showing where those overlaps are and showcasing some recipes that aren't even Persian at all. So I love it. I love how you have the macaroni and also the timbale. If Am I pronouncing that correctly? Timballo. Timballo. <gasps> yes, uh, there is something that is very similar to a timballo there. That's the thing about recipes. The, the thing that I was saying before is that Different people come up with same ideas in similar situations, okay? And these recipes are not bound, have never been bound by geographical, religious, political likenesses. They don't care. Mm -hmm. Recipes don't care, okay? It's very interesting. And, well, you know, the word dolma is Turkish. You know, the the dish dolma, it comes from Turkey. It comes out of the uh, kitchens of Ottoman but the word dolma is a Turkish word. It means hollowed out. It literally means hollowed out. It's a Turkish word, yes. Because wherever there are borders, people fight over these things. So there, there are a lot of fights between dishes that, you know, is it Turkish? Is it Greek? I touch upon a couple of them. There's also this triangle phyllo pastry with feta in them. And there's a whole story there in the book that, mm, is it from Greece? Is it from Turkey? Uh, we didn't know because it, it could be ancient Greek or it could be just Turkish because then the whole tradition of layering very, very thin slices of dough, which also gives life to baklava and all of this thing. This is actually from the Turkish people of the, you know, Central Asia who then migrated to the era that is now Azerbaijan and Turkey. I love it. It's so interesting. It, there's such an old, old regions and cultures and also close to each other. And exactly. Maybe undocumented. How do we know? <laughs> and they're all so delicious. Well, actually, I mean, some of them are undocumented, but some of them are also very well documented enough so that, you know, we can tell. I mean, all of these things they were not, you know, in very difficult sources for me to find. But the specific thing about dolme, I would say is, I would say there aren't two similar uh, dolme recipes in Turkey. There are definitely not two similar to, uh, dolme recipes in Iran. Mm-hmm. Because already my mother's recipe is different from anyone else's that I've had. Tell us about your mother's dolme. Is it sweet and sour? Is it, you know, what does she have inside? Meat or no meat? That's a very <laughs> interesting thing because my mother... Her vine leaves dolme, and you know, which is the same way that my grandmother made it. Mm-hmm. She would never make it sweet and sour. She hated. This is one of those things that that she would say, "Oh, we make it like this." Far sign So the Persians they do it like that. So what was she differentiating herself from? We and they. Who's the they? The day is the Farsa, the Persians, because she would identify as Azari when, when making wine leaves dolma. Okay, gotcha. So she would have, of course, rice and a little bit of meat. 
some herbs, which I don't remember, you know, the mix of herbs is very important, but I don't remember what that is. And then she would add a little bit of very thick yogurt or ghee, like the butter oh. from yogurt. So they would add it and she would never, never, ever make it sweet and sour. But she would make her dolma of cabbages. So the cabbage rolls, mm -hmm. that would be sweet and sour. Oh, with a lot of mm -hmm. saffron. So depending on what the vessel was for the dolme, yes. grape leaves, cabbage, or even peppers. Also, the stuffing would change. And then, for example, in Iran, but there is this whole... I remember I asked on Twitter, I asked the Iranian Twitter, how do you make your dolme with peppers and eggplants and things? And, you know, it was like the vase of Pandora. They were not two similar recipes. But something very interesting that I found is that some Jewish families in Iran, they would add dried fruits like raisins and walnuts to it, which is something they do also in the Jewish community in Syria. So wow. it's very nice because the recipe is kind of different, but they relate it in the use of dried food in their dolma. So interesting. Yeah, so many versions. There are never two similar recipes in that. And then there are some recipes that are perhaps more, I wouldn't say more Iranian about dolme, but uh, definitely like deep Turkey, Anatolia, north of like, the, you know, the Aleppo part of, because the Aleppo cuisine is very similar to the Iranian cuisine in some things and the deep Turkey part. So for example, in those parts, you can also find apple dolmas or queen's dolmas. Wow. There is a recipe for, for apple dolma in the book, but that, that one is not a recipe that I had ever as a child. So I, I developed it based on, you know, research and how I wanted it to be. Yeah, that's a great point. Tell us a little bit about kind of like the recipes that are in the book. Would you call them more traditional or how would you define the type of recipes that you have? I would say the recipes are traditional because I also wanted to make this point of similarity. So there was no point for me to, you know, develop my own recipes that are not that are completely unrelated to traditional recipes and talk about these similarities so the, the apple dolma I developed myself but it's based on something that exists it's just that you know it, it wasn't in my childhood memories and then you know when it goes to the other two chapters I wanted them to be to be recognizable as the dish that they are mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point that makes sense do you have a favorite recipe or somewhere that you would have someone start when they pick up your book? I mean, it's my baby, so all of my recipes are my favorite recipes. There you go. <laughs> Smart answer. Yeah. Just make them all. Yeah. But I would say, I mean, especially if, if somebody wants to start with Iranian food, I, there are, it starts with three basic recipes, which is how to brew saffron, how to make the golden onion, piazda. Yes. I loved that part. And how to make rice. So I think that's very useful. But apart from that, perhaps my favorite chapter is actually the in-between chapter because I love the food from that era. And especially for this season, there are a lot of good recipes in there to try. They're very fresh. They're very vibrant. And then there are two pomegranate recipes that are, they're both poultry and both with pomegranate. One of them is the guinefowl with pomegranate in the Italy chapter. And one of them is the chicken braised in pomegranate from the Iran chapter, which are very, very similar. Those recipes basically are the same dish. It's just, you know, the aromatics change with them. But there are very interesting stories in them. And one of the recipes that gave me the idea from this book, and I thought that, you know, they're similar places. One, of, one is from Gilan in north of Iran. The other one is from Le Marque in the countryside. But there is actual historical reference regarding that. And I think your listeners should, should read that part too. Yeah. The most fun part are the stories that go with the recipes. The first thing that you said, the saffron tips and the golden onions section and the how to cook rice tips and things that you said are very helpful. I mean, I have been cooking Persian food for many years now. People call us experts. And I learned a lot, you know, oh, just you. by the way that you described it. And I wanted to implement those techniques. And I mean, if you know how to do saffron, golden onions and rice, yeah, then the rest is kind of 
I mean, it, it's all important, but that's really the most important things. And you really did a nice job, I think, of covering on those. Thank you. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. I really loved the kind of approach you have to entertaining. I think I can connect with you on that where you kind of it feels like you are a little bit more carefree about it and that you want to have fun and kind of make it easy to host. So I love that because I feel like I I, I try to have that mentality too when I'm when I'm hosting is like I want to be able to enjoy the time with my guests and enjoy eating good food together with them. So I loved kind of seeing that throughout the book as your kind of methodology on entertaining. Oh, thank you. I'm so, so happy it has come out like this because, I mean, this is something I aspire to, but I don't always manage to do that. I always like get to my tables that I'm disheveled. I'm very exhausted from <laughs> hours of cooking. But yes, that's, you know, in my ideal world. But, you know, that's the thing with some of the Italian food and some of the food from in, in between, there are things that you, you can you can put up together with your guests, especially now that it's summer, you make a salad, you do this, you do, you know, you throw a pasta together. With Iranian food, it's very difficult because it needs time because time is one of the most important ingredients in the food of Iran in general. So you need to work a lot before that. But I think it's it's most fun when you can share you know, the good times, you know, open a bottle of wine together, do the last preps together and, you know, in, enjoy everything about the food together and share everything. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So would you tell us where listeners can find the book, where they can follow you on social media? Can you give us your handles online? Yes, of course. You can find me at, at Lab Noon on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me as Noon on Substack, but actually the real URL is still labnoon.substack.com. And you can find the book on Interlinks website, which is my publisher. You can find it on Amazon and you can find it wherever books are sold to be perfectly honest i don't know what websites there are in the united states so wherever you can find books you can find pomegranates and artichokes congratulations on your new cookbook i actually have pomegranate and artichokes in the pantry right now so i'm excited to try your recipes congratulations and thank you for your time thank you thank you so much Sakana june have a great day and thanks again for your time Thank you so much. This was great. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Modern Persian Food Podcast with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling a friend or giving us a good rating. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com or on Instagram for the recipes and information we talked about today. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time. Oh,